test things out here real quick. We've got live on Facebook as well. So we're just going to test this out really quick before we get started. We're going to take a look at um, the sound levels look like. Just give me a brief moment to get a feel for where that is at. We didn't have any time to check out that earlier. That's how life works. It's testing, testing. The sound levels look like. That's actually perfect for that. That's good. View dashboard. How does a viewing dashboard work? latest comments okay I guess that works alright All right, now I just need to check Facebook really quick make sure that it is live there as expected first time doing this I just click under live and there we are. Let's see what it sounds like. Click for more info. Now I just need to check Facebook real quick. Oh, that sounds good. All right, so I'm um, going to go ahead and uh, begin. Uh, unfortunately, there wasn't a way to do the the podcast. Uh, where I could use the microphone, but I wasn't able to avoid being able to, uh, having to use the um, what you can obviously see. Uh, obviously, you don't see me because uh, I am I prefer anonymity. Uh, so, with that said, uh, we're just going to get going, and I'll. Just, I mean, YouTube is going to be the, the main. Uh, place for this anyways so uh, when it comes down to um, like conversations and things like that people will want to uh, go on YouTube now for those who may not be familiar with John Wesley he was an Anglican priest and was a faithful child of the church his entire life uh, he loved the Book of Common Prayer he loved the uh, the uh, 36 Articles of Religion. Uh, he basically loved everything about his church. Now, with that said, he's also the father of Methodism. So it's important to understand a little bit about his, his context. Now, for those who actually read the sermon today, or the, this week, uh, one thing that I wanted to highlight is that this was preached at Oxford before the university on June 18th, 1738. Now why do you think that is an important date? Well, on May 24th, I believe it was, May 24th, just a couple weeks prior, John Wesley had his Eldersgate experience, for those who are not familiar, after John Wesley had been ordained, he went over to America, to Georgia, to preach to the Indians. And he came back feeling that he was unsuccessful in his ministry. Uh, perhaps uh, he wasn't received as well as he thought that he ought to have been received. And when he came back, uh, being distraught, he also struggled in his faith and almost became convinced that he should give up his preaching. Uh, 
thank God he did not. He because after that he has produced so many wonderful sermons that uh, make God's word speak in a way um, that changes hearts and still does today. What was important about the Eldersgate experience, as Wesley had stated shortly after, that from the time of his ordination until this particular event, about 10 years had passed, and he speaks of that time. He, he says, I was a papist and knew it not. In other words, for whatever reason, he seemed to have thought or at some level that uh, salvation was somehow achieved through works. And uh, it is interesting that um, this sermon should stand on the heels of his experience where he talks about salvation by faith. And I, I'm, although I'd, I don't quite understand exactly, you know, um, the struggle he went through theologically, but at least experientially, perhaps he did not experience uh, the inward witness of the Spirit upon his uh, father's uh, deathbed. Uh, he told Wesley that the greatest evidence of Christianity is the inward witness of the Spirit. That God's Spirit will bear witness with your spirit that you are a child of God. He believed his father had such a witness, but up until this point he did not uh, have this within himself. And uh, he was confronted by a friend, Peter Buller, who wanted to convince him, encourage him to continue in his preaching, to continue in his work. Because Wesley thought, well, if I don't have this myself, how can I preach to others? How can I hope to convince them? And he said to him, preach faith until you have it. And because, then because you have it, you shall preach faith. And this was very important for his Eldersgate experience because Wesley went to this meeting and he sat down and he began listening to a reader read Luther's preface to the Romans. When Wesley heard the words, faith is God's work in us, he felt his heart strangely warmed, strangely warmed. And he knew, he had an experience that God had given him the gift of faith. And so this kind of becomes a turning point for him that is very important. So today we're going to dive in to what may be, although I can, you know, don't quote me on this, the very first sermon that he preached after his Eldersgate experience. So, I've made several highlights on things that I wanted to discuss, but please feel free to jump in at any point, share your ideas. Um, it will influence how discussions will continue to go, and uh, otherwise you can just continue to listen to me to, um, to talk about it. Uh, this is based on Ephesians 2, 8. By grace you are saved through faith. He says, all the blessings which God hath bestowed upon man are of his mere grace, bounty, or favor, his free, undeserved favor, favor altogether undeserved, man having no claim to the least of his mercies. So he starts off that anything and everything that we could potentially get from God is of God's free grace. It's not something that is merited by us. It isn't something that we somehow uh, get God's attention as if he's looking about and we have to do something amazing to get his attention. But rather, 
it is something that God bestows freely from himself because he wants to. And the greatest thing about that is, is there isn't anything you can do to make him want to. He already does, so rest easy. And there isn't anything you can do to make him not want to. All right, he wills that all men be saved. So he is going to chase after you with everything that he is, which is why when we come to him, we then give him our whole selves because we want everything that God has for us. And we want to live all of that out for him. Most of Wesley's sermons are going to be laid out in this way. There's going to be a, an introduction of sorts. Then he's going to tell you what he is going to tell you. He will tell you what points he or he's going to cover, and then he proceeds to cover them. And the very first point that he discusses is what faith is, what faith it is, through which we are saved. And in this, Wesley makes some distinctions. The first distinction he describes as the faith of a heathen. He states, Now God requires of a heathen to believe that God is, that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him, and that he is to be sought for glorifying him as God by giving him thanks for all things and by a careful patience, practice of moral virtue, of justice, mercy, and truth toward their fellow creatures. Without excuse, if he did not believe thus much, it would be problematic. But he refers to this as the faith of a heathen, as one who is, is still in the world, does not yet fully understand all the things of God, but he knows this much from the things which God had created that there is a God and that we should somehow concern ourselves with him. But this isn't sufficient, despite the fact that you may have such sentiments, that you have, you've had such thoughts. These are but the early stirrings, I should say, of the grace of God in the heart. He also speaks of the faith of a devil, where he goes on to quote several passages where even demons are stating that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Among many other things, such as there is a coming judgment. Have you come to torture us before the appointed time? They knew that he had authority. Send us into the pigs, they say. They knew this much, but this is not the faith that Wesley is talking about. The faith, rather, it is faith in Christ, Christ in God through Christ, are the proper objects of it. Quote, it is not merely a speculative, rational thing, a cold, lifeless ascent, a train of ideas in the head, but also a disposition in the heart. Think of this, and it's kind of scary to even think that the faith, <laughs> the, 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 the faith of the devil or of demons in James, where he begins to talk about faith, he says, even the demons believe and shudder. So not only do they grasp the things of God, but they have an appropriate response to God given their state. Now, what's scary is there is a great many 
people on our planet who've lived, who live and will live, who may never even experience this much. And in some way you could say that it is even worse, a worse state. Because not only do they, in the case of the demons, they know who they are in relation to God. They know who he is, and they have an appropriate response to it, given their state, which is to shudder, which at the very least, we should come to that point on our journey as God stirs in our hearts to draw us nearer to himself. But to think that a man could be even worse off than this, to even fight against whether we believe that God is even there, that we continue to tend to atheism if we do not care for our souls, among a great many other things, such as not even in a coming judgment. Some have become so calloused in their conscience, having seared it with, as with a red-hot iron, that they're not even sensitive anymore, nor have any conviction that the things that they do are even wrong. This, I think, is an even worse state than the faith of the devil. But then he goes on to talk, and I quote, that it acknowledges, this faith by which we are saved, acknowledges the necessity and merit of his death and the power of his resurrection. It acknowledges his death as the only sufficient means of redeeming man from death eternal, and his resurrection as the restoration of us all to life and immortality, in as much as he was delivered for our sins and rose again for our justification. Christian faith is then not only an assent to the whole gospel of Christ, but also a full reliance on the blood of Christ. So you can see that the two things, not only being aware, and so he touches on a few things. He touches upon an acknowledgement of our sinfulness and her need for his blood to acknowledge not only that we need his blood, but that his blood is the only thing that is sufficient. There's nowhere else to go. His blood is the one and only thing that will cleanse us from all sin. And not only that it's through the merit of his death, merit meaning it is something that Christ does for us, something he does on our behalf, and also speaks of the resurrection and power, meaning not only does the blood cleanse us from all sin, but then we are given the Holy Spirit by which he sheds abroad in your heart love, hope, and faith in this transforming your life. So it's not merely a faith that Jesus is the Son of God. It's understanding who we are in relation to him and having an appropriate response to him given our state. And since God reaches us in that state to draw us up and out of that state, to change where we are, to change who we are, no longer are we slaves to sin, no longer are we mere servants of God. We are children of God whereby he puts the spirit in your heart whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The whole gospel of Christ, not just to assent to it. It's not sufficient enough to have read all of scripture. It's not sufficient enough to have dove deep into the greatest theological musings possible. Rather, 
you must fully rely on the cure of your disease. You must fully rely upon the blood of Christ because without which you cannot be holy and without holiness no man shall see the Lord. You must trust in quote you must trust in the merits of his life, death, and resurrection. And we must cleave to him as our wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, or in one word, our salvation. Once again, um, anyone wants to jump in with a question, a comment, please do. We're going to move on to the second point of the sermon, which is what salvation it is, which is through this faith is the second thing to be considered. He first states it's a present salvation. In other words, God doesn't just leave us in our sins. We aren't merely looking for something to be done in the future, but rather there is something that God does right now. We probably have all heard the expression that God loves us all right where we're at, but he loves us too much to leave us there. And the, and the point is, is that God comes and meets you where you're at and changes you right where you're at now. There's a present salvation that is occurring so that we can clearly state that we are saved from sin. Now, now you can approach God. You can approach his unapproachable light with confidence, knowing that despite the fact that at one time you merited hell and death, now as a child of God, you can come to God because he has forgiven your sins, no longer holding your sins against you, no longer are you living in the guilt and shame of who you were, but rather... He gives you a new heart. He gives you a new mind. And he clothes you with Christ. Because he shall save his people from their sins. It's from the sins in which we are saved from. God didn't merely come to remove guilt from the sin. He did not merely come to merely not impute guilt to you for your sin. Rather, he changes you and saves you. He pulls you out. You experience something new. There's something new about you. God has made a difference. Now, So you are saved both from the guilt and from the power of sin. Sin no longer has control over you. Your heart now has Christ as Lord. Sin no longer has mastery over you because Christ is now your Lord and because you have accepted him as Lord in your life, because you have a full reliance on the blood of Christ. Sin no longer has the same power over you like it used to. You should experience a new freedom in Christ. For where the Spirit is, there is freedom. And although your flesh is weak, the Spirit is always willing. So God gives us his Holy Spirit to strengthen us. He also gives us, he saves us from the fear of God. Not the kind of fear that we used to have. The kind of servile fear. From the fear that which has torment. 
from fear of punishment, from fear of the wrath of God, whom they now no longer regard as a severe master. God now is our Father, and we have only the fear of possibly offending Him, for disappointing Him, for not living according to all the grace which God has given unto us. This shall be the only fear that should remain in you, a holy fear, the kind of fear that is appropriate for a child to have. We want God to be, in a sense, proud of us. So we are saved from the fear Though, as Wesley says here, not from the possibility of falling away from his grace. There's a healthy concern that we should have in our Christian walk. Because believe it or not, it is possible that we could be only a few decisions away from being right back where we were. Now what's important to note is that we don't have the type of fear that God will somehow withdraw his grace. He changes his mind. You are no longer in his favor just because he decided so. This is not the kind of fear we are talking about. We're talking about the, the, the kind of concern that we all should have when it comes to living out our Christian life and obedience to God and trusting Him, putting our, our faith and hope in Him and to live out our faith through love, through charity. A real danger does exist that we could be, we could shipwreck our faith, we could be led away, we could be tempted, we could be deceived. So we must always be on guard. We must, must always test the spirits. We must always be on watch and be prayerful. Because there is an enemy out there who wants to destroy your faith in God. We must have a holy concern in this. But yet, it isn't without the peace of God which we find through Jesus Christ. We have peace. So we don't have to be overwhelmed with possible despair that maybe at some point God is just going to simply reject me. Or maybe right now in the present case or any time in the future I might not be part of one of the predestined. Rather, we can have peace. Because we have a present salvation, and we have the Holy Spirit who is actively working in our hearts. And we also have hope of the glory of God. The love of God shed abroad in our hearts through the Holy Spirit, which he has given unto them. Then he goes on to a very interesting point. When he begins to flesh out what he means to be saved from the power of sin. You will find an optimism in Wesley's teachings. And as we go through his sermons, we will find some sort of checks and balances to what he means. For those who have read this, he speaks very plainly. And I will actually just read this section so the force of his optimism can be can be heard he that is by faith born of God sins not one by any habitual sin for all habitual sin is sin reigning 
as we get to um, some of his other sermons, like repentance and uh, 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 repentance of believers and sin in believers, um, we will find the balance to to understand exactly what Wesley says here. His point is the optimism that as a child of God, while sin may still remain, it no longer reigns. Quote, But sin cannot reign in any that believe, nor by any willful sin. For his will, while he abides in the faith, is utterly set against all sin and abhorrent and abhors it as deadly poison, nor by any sinful desire, for he continually desires the holy and perfect will of God. And any tendency to an unholy desire, he, by the grace of God, stifles it in the birth. Nor does he sin by infirmities, whether in act, word, or thought, for his infirmities have no concurrence of his will, and without this, they are not properly sins. Thus he that is born of God does not commit sin. And though he cannot say he hath not sinned, yet now he sins not. I think most of us have probably had the experience of sin after coming to Christ. And when we go over Wesley's sermons, uh, we will see when he addresses that case. In this, he is emphasizing the power of God's grace to such an extent. He is optimizing uh, his optimism. in that the power of sin is broken. So much so that when somebody does sin, it's because they have weakened in their faith. So for Wesley, as long as the faith is alive and vibrant, a person who is actively living out that faith will not sin willfully, voluntarily, against a known will of God. Because in Wesley's view, to do so is to abandon your faith in that moment. Because in that moment, you set Christ aside. You place yourself again under the mastery of sin. And faith is the only thing that can bring you out of that. So keep that in mind that when Wesley is talking about this particular state where a Christian has Christ as Lord, that sin no longer has control over him like it used to. Because in Wesley's view... Salvation is not simply being saved in your sin. As, as Luther used to use the analogy of a dunghill covered with snow. In, in, in other words, you're just as sinful and, you know, as bad as you ever have been, in a sense. The, the, the difference as in his doctrine of the glorious exchange, that all of Christ's righteousness is simply now ours. Not because something changes in us, which of course the, the, the Catholic Church deemed to be heretical. And, and Wesley likewise criticized Luther for not really understanding the role of sanctification. Whether that be accurate or not, that was Wesley's perspective, and that's what we're looking at. Wesley saw that Christ came to save us, not in our sins, not to simply remove the guilt from the sins that are there, 
but to save us from our sins and the consequences of sin. And in this, he refers to it as justification. As he says, taken in the largest sense implies a deliverance from guilt and punishment by the atonement of Christ actually applied to the soul of the sinner, now believing on him, and a deliverance from the power of sin through Christ formed in his heart, so that he who is thus justified or saved by faith is indeed born again. He is born again of the Spirit unto a new life which is hid with Christ in God. Going on in the might of the Lord, his God, from faith to faith, from grace to grace, until at length he come unto a perfect man unto the measure of the, full, uh, the, measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. One of the most interesting things, since this is so-called the Catholic Wesleyan channel, is that Wesley, on occasion, will acquiesce in some sense to the Catholic understanding of justification. In a few instances, he will speak of this largest sense in which the word can be taken. And here he uses the language that justification involves a change. It's not a mere forgiveness or just, if I, just as if I have not sinned kind of God no, now looks at you through a pair of Jesus glasses. The difference is, is that now we are like Christ. Now we have a new heart. That justification, just like sanctification, is the process by which a person is made righteous. It is the process by which a person is made just. It's God affecting the very change in our heart to be like the very way that he sees you in relation to Christ. In later sermons, you will find where Wesley will note how this is often confounded. So it's going to be interesting uh, what he has to say when he goes to make very plain to describe the nature of justification and juxtapose that against what he goes on to describe as sanctification. But at least in his early writings, he's much more Catholic in his perspective. And perhaps he, um, in, a, in a way, will elucidate exactly what he means by what he refers to as justification. The third part of his sermon He goes on to state several objections, which I will read and, and then I will um, expand upon his responses. He says, to preach salvation, someone might say, to preach salvation or justification by faith alone is to preach against holiness and good works. This is the objection. To which a short answer may be given. It would be so if we spake, as some do, of a faith which was separate from these, but we speak of a faith which is not so, but productive of good works and all holiness. So it's the idea that justification is on the basis of faith, but faith is never alone. Perhaps some of you have heard the expression that while we are saved by faith alone, meaning on the basis of faith, not to the exclusion of everything else, because the term salvation by faith alone 
should at least in the language that is used to give us pause because the only time in scripture where it says faith alone is in James where it states that we are not saved by faith alone so we might not want to utilize that kind of language but rather to state that faith is the beginning the fountain the foundation of all salvation of all changes that God is going to work in your heart and this faith which as Paul says faith working through love is what really counts faith working through love this faith that Wesley's talking about is a fruitful lively faith that does produce good works in all holiness it is not a so-called faith of so-called antinomianism as Wesley describes it as one who no longer concerns themselves with trying to fulfill the law of love because their view that because of the righteousness of Christ because Christ merited this for us there isn't a thing that we need to do we can just sit back and do nothing which isn't the type of attitude that really comes from a child of God it's not the type of attitude or disposition that comes from a lively faith that God himself works within you but rather it is a, it is a faith that works he also brings up the objection do we not make void the law through faith we answer first all who preach not faith do manifestly make void the law either directly and grossly by limitations and comments that eat out all the spirit of the text or indirectly by not pointing out the only means whereby it is possible to perform it but rather we establish the law love is the fulfillment of the law it is the only commandment that we really need because when you live out of that all right when we are moved by the compelling love of Christ in our own life to show that love which the Holy Spirit sheds abroad in our own hearts this fulfills everything it, it covers everything so that we can love, know, and serve God so that we may be reasonably happy in this life. Wesley states, while, while they trust in the blood of Christ alone, he's, he's, while we trust in the blood of Christ alone, we use all the ordinances which he hath appointed meaning the means of grace he has a sermon by that title do all the good works which he hath before prepared that you should walk therein and enjoy and manifest all holy and heavenly tempers even the same mind that was in Christ Jesus when God makes you new we live out of this newness when we're no longer in a state of sin but in a state of grace we are now living out of this grace it is something that we live out of not because it's just something where we're merely enabled to just do this thing but rather it's the outpouring of your own heart that's what the Holy Spirit does it gives you living water that springs up and pours forth not only for your benefit but for the benefit of others it should be a state so natural to the Christian it should be as if we were breathing it is what we do he goes on through several other Uh, objections that, that might be laid he states of yourselves comes neither your faith nor your salvation 
of yourselves, I will repeat this, of yourselves come neither your faith nor your salvation. Faith is not a gift you give to God. But rather, faith is God's work in you. Faith is a gift that God gives to you. It is through this that we come to Him. It's God's own grace, as Wesley referred to it as the prevenient of grace, the grace that prevents us from being the worst version of ourselves. It is the grace that goes before, that gives us the, the, the dawn of grace in the heart, the initial stirrings, the, the, uh, the, you know, the momentary glimpses of, of revelation as, as the light of Christ shines upon the heart. It is God, in a sense, as he goes to, to say that, in a sense, because of the work, the prevenient work of, of God, to draw us to himself, that all men have received some measure of salvation, meaning that God's grace is already preventing us from becoming the worst version of ourselves. But not that we could not. But that God meets us there. So not even our faith is something that is of ourselves. It's not something that we muster up in ourselves and we come to, uh, to a mere intellectual ascent in the mind or we we somehow stir up within ourselves as some something rooted in nature, something of our natural capacity. Faith, rather, is something that God gives to you. Neither is salvation of the works we do when we believe. For it is then God that works in us, and he also works through us, I should add. And therefore, that he gives us a reward for what he himself works. Interestingly enough, um, and uh, I'll be able to uh, use this as uh, my, my uh, segue into uh, the final segment because uh, we're coming close now to the end of our hour. Is that uh, I read through the decree on justification from the, the Council of Trent this week. After reading what Wesley said here, I read through, and there, from what I can see, not a single difference. I mean, like, for example, after you, if, if you read through this sermon, for instance, and I, I'm setting something up here that might, be not, might not be apparent yet, but if you've read through this sermon, and you immediately then read through the decree on justification from the, from, from, from the, uh, uh, the Council of Trent, that you would be hard-pressed to find any difference between what Wesley is saying in this sermon. One thing I, uh, people probably wonder why I would use the term the Catholic Wesleyan for this page, for example. Um, I, I, I like to tell people uh, Wesley may be Catholic uh, because um, the more I studied his works, the, the more of the Catholic substance which he has that I find absent in the reformers like Luther and Calvin and Zwingli. As well as, as we're going to see in a moment, his anti-Catholic bias which was very, very common among the clergy in the 1700s, the 18th century. So when I was able to whittle down 
his anti-Catholic bias and completely absorb the Catholic substance of his work. Uh, it, it basically gave me a language to understand the Catholic Church in a way that perhaps other people do not. If you read through this sermon and immediately read through that decree on justification for the Council of Trent, you're going to be very hard-pressed to find any difference whatsoever in the teachings between the two. However, I will add one caveat that, like I said, later on, although he speaks of justification in this larger sense, he will also speak of it as a more narrow sense as well. And uh, we will dive into that more when he himself makes those distinctions. Then we will discuss them. Then I will explain them. But just keep in mind right now that he was thoroughly versed in the doctrine of justification in a way that was very, very Catholic. Especially when he, go, uh, when he goes on to say that the works, that neither is salvation of the works we do when we believe, for it is God, then God that works in us, and therefore that he gives us a reward for what he himself works. This is the very, this is literally the very last section of the Council of Trent on justification. Where, where, where um, it, it quotes very, very plainly from, from, from Romans. It talks about God giving eternal salvation as a reward. All right. Not something that we have earned, but it's something that God does it in and through us. To take us from that present salvation, because there's the I have been saved, I will be saved, and there's still a future aspect to our salvation. And as we grow in our relationship with God, then our relationship is going to be straightened. Uh, strengthened. Another way of saying that is as God works in and through your heart, God's going to, re God's going to reward his own work in you. He's going to, he has so much glory that he can share it with you, as Ephesians says. But let's jump now to, uh, to, to segue by this, because he says um, near the end of the sermon, by grace you are saved through faith. And let me just read what he says here, um, and, and then I'll, I'll, I'll break this down a little bit more, uh, and then we'll, we'll close. He says, because never was the maintaining this doctrine more seasonable than it is at this day. Nothing but this can effectually prevent the increase of the Romish delusion among us. It is endless to attack one by one all the errors of that church. You see where, why I set this up. But salvation by faith strikes at the root and all fall at once where this is established. It was this doctrine which our church justly caused the strong rock and foundation of the Christian religion that first drove poppery out of these kingdoms and it is this alone can keep it out. This is where, as I said, you will begin to f see a certain anti-Catholic bias in the work of Wesley. Occasionally he will refer it to as popery or refer to Catholics as papists. Or he will talk about uh, the Romish church. And, and interesting, he, even for a man of his stature, even for a man that was seen so thoroughly versed in Scripture and interpreting it in a Catholic manner, I find it absolutely amazing 
that for whatever reason, while he's in this sermon, like like I said, you could read this sermon and, and read the uh, d- decree on, on Trent, and you, you're you're not going to find any differences that, that that are apparent to you. And so, um, <clears throat> like f- for example, in he he's talking here about faith being the rock and foundation. The salvation, uh, the salvation by faith. But in the Council of Trent, about faith itself, and I'm trying to pull this up as I am talking here. Um, because I'm spelling it wrong. Okay. The Council of Trent states. In what manner is it to be understood that the impious is justified by faith and gratuitously? This is from the Council of Trent. And whereas the Apostle says that man is justified by faith and freely, those words are to be understood in that sense which the perpetual consent of the Catholic Church has held and expressed, to wit, that we are therefore said to be justified by faith because faith is the beginning of human salvation, the foundation and the root of all justification, without which it is impossible to please God and to come unto the fellowship of his sons. But we are therefore said to be justified freely because that none of those things which precede justification, whether faith or works, merit the grace itself of justification for if it be a grace it is now not by works otherwise as the same apostle says grace is of no more grace wesley himself could have written what i just read from the council of trent and Basically, in his own work of referring to this doctrine as the foundation of the Christian faith, that salvation by faith, you can kind of see by looking at the two that, uh, unfortunately, despite the fact, and we'll, we'll dive in this a little bit more, but you know, he speaks of Martin Luther for having revived this doctrine. We will uh, explore at certain times there are some sermons in which uh, I think uh, the mystery of iniquity and I think some others where he elucidates and expounds upon his so-called historiography that is his mapping out of the Christian church and Wesley had a common view that at the time of Constantine that uh, it did not usher in the golden age of Christianity but the iron age it was a certain uh, interpretation that somehow the church had become so corrupt and bad that all of the doctrines needed to be thrown out and reinterpreted so just as a summary because I tried to pack a lot in there during this hour. Faith is God's work in you. This is not of yourself. You do not merit this faith. There's nothing you can do to work for it. It's something that God wants to give you. And it's not something that God wants to give you tomorrow, but today. If you hear his voice, come to him. God is calling you. And he's ready to give you the faith of salvation. That faith whereby you can be saved from your sins. That faith, that reliance upon the blood of Christ. That power that is in the Holy Spirit. That love that is shed abroad in your heart. This is God's work in you.
and he who began a good work in you will bring it on to completion. So put your, your, your faith in Christ because it is God who's going to do that in and through you. And then you will have peace. So I appreciate everybody uh, hanging out tonight for those who um, may not only be listening to this vodcast, but also um, who may watch it later. Um, I plan on, I will announce uh, tomorrow the next sermon that we are going to read. I haven't decided whether or not uh, we are going to do of the so-called 52 standard sermons if we are going to just uh, go into um, the next one that would be chronologically on that list. Um, but I, I, I really think, at least for now, and I, I will finalize this tomorrow, that I think that we're going to read his sermon, The Almost Christian. Uh, which was preached uh, three years later before uh, the same university at Oxford. So the almost Christian, perhaps. And uh, that will be, I will be aiming for 7 p.m. Eastern Time. And I will be live both on the Facebook, the Catholic Wesleyan page, and also on the, uh, the, the YouTube page. So... Uh, with that, uh, God bless you. Uh, may he keep you and strengthen you and uh, lead you this week.